W. W. L. 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 And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why Clem Farpool can kick or get a win drop or Clem Ticilio go 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 does not have an American football team. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to Modern Life is Goodish. I'm Dave Gorman. I have a laptop, a remote control, and a large screen. And the reason that I mentioned at the top of the show is that it has caused a little bit of controversy in my own life recently. Uh, myself, Mrs. Gorman, and a couple of friends were taking part in a pub quiz recently. And I like a pub quiz. Oh, of course I do. It is two of my favourite things combined. <laughs> Not that that's a hard and fast rule, obviously, it doesn't always work, you know. I like spice. I like girls. <laughs> and yet I hate Edwina Curry. So it doesn't always work. But I like this particular pub quiz because they enforce the no phones rule rigorously. There is no cheating in this pub quiz, no looking stuff up. It is a proper quiz. So we were there in the pub quiz and the quiz master says, next question. What is the longest single word place name in the world? I will award one point if you can show that you know the answer and a second point if you can spell it correctly. And Mrs Gorman got wildly excited because she could feel the rumble in the room. Everyone there was thinking, oh, I know this one. It's that Welsh place, the one that ends in go, go, gok. But Mrs Gorman was there thinking, we are going to cream this quiz because my husband knows how to spell it. <laughs> and I do know how to spell it. I will demonstrate that for you now, ladies and gentlemen. Now, obviously, I am aware that that <laughs> could be one hell of a crib sheet. It's on that screen, it's on that little screen there. And in Teleland, people are always going to think you're reading it off an auto cue. So to prove to you that I genuinely do know how to spell it, I am going to do it while wearing a blindfold, ladies and gentlemen. That's what I'm going to do. Don't all fuck off. <laughs> Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Klanfapo Gingeko, Gerwindrobo, Klantisilio, Gogogok, spelled correctly while blindfolded. It is, I believe, double L A N F A I R P W double L G W Y N G Y double L G O G E R Y C H W Y R N D R O B W double L double L A N T Y S I L I O G O G O G O C. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Not a popular child at school, ladies and gentlemen. Not a popular child at school. But I immediately had to pour cold water on Mrs. Gorman's excitement and say, no, 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 do not get excited because I can spell Sanfire, Paul Gingick, et cetera, et cetera. That is not going to help us in this quiz because I also happen to know that that is not the longest single word place name in the world. The longest single word place name in the world is actually in New Zealand, and I don't know how you pronounce it, but I know that it starts with Tau Matawakatangi, and then it goes on and on and on <laughs> and on. Now, obviously, I do not know how to pronounce that properly, but I do know how to spell it. <laughs> And I'm going to demonstrate that for you now, but I'll tell you what, to make it fair, uh, this time, why don't you all wear blindfolds if you reach under your seat? So you should... OK, that's not going to work, is it? Uh, I, I can spell it because I have a handy mnemonic to remind me. Uh, some of you might remember it from school when you were kids. Uh, what it is, is the, the angriest uncle makes a terrible auntie when having a kiss and tickling a naughty girl. <laughs> I have a nice grandma and kindly older aunt. Unfortunately, an uncle or two are mean, and their elderly aunts take umbrage regularly. <laughs> Independence Party UK are kind <laughs> about Polish immigrants. <laughs> kind, I mean, are unkind. <laughs> now, get a helpful older relative or not unhelpful kindly uncle. <laughs> Prepare older kids and infants while helping elderly non-uncles, aunts. <laughs> Keep it tight and never agitate the angriest, hairiest uncle. There you go. That's how I remember it. That's how I remember it. Yeah. The trouble is, I can't remember the mnemonic unless I'm actually looking at the words. So it's no use whatsoever. 
Anyway, we get to the end of the quiz, and the quiz master is going through the answers, and he says, the longest single word place name in the world is... I was outraged. It has fewer letters than Taumatawakatangi. It's not the longest single word place name in the world. I went up to that quiz master and I had a bit of a go. I said, you are wrong there. It is actually Taumatawakatangi. He said, it isn't. It is Clanfar PG. I said, no, it's not. Look it up on your phone. He said, I can't. Phones aren't allowed. <laughs> but you're the quiz master. You are allowed to look it up on your phone. He said, look, even if you're right, it wouldn't count because Taumatawakatangi, or whatever you called it, obviously isn't an English word. <laughs> At what point did Clanfarpo go and get go and go 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 become an English word? He said, look, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that everyone else thinks it's Clanfar PG. What? So what matters is that everyone else is entitled to be wrong together. I thought we were in a quiz. I didn't realise we were playing family fortunes. <laughs> I thought the idea that we would be rewarded for knowing more than other people and not for sharing idiocy with the largest group. <laughs> he said, look, you're spoiling the atmosphere. Stop getting worked up about whether it's true or not. It's a fun fact. A fun fact? What the hell is a fun fact? What does that actually mean, fun fact? I thought facts were binary. They were either true or not. But apparently that's not the case with fun facts. This is the fun size Mars bar definition of fun, isn't it? That's less of a Mars bar and this is less of a fact. I suppose... Some facts. I, I can see the point that some facts kind of are fun. You know, every now and then there's a fact that will make you go, hmm. It's just that noise. That, mm, yeah. that is the fun noise in a fact, isn't it? For example, I'll give you one. I, I, I made that noise up when I first heard it. Did you know that polar bears and penguins never meet in the wild because polar bears live in the Arctic and penguins live in the Antarctic? Yeah? I think most people think they live together. You hear that and you go, oh. Yeah. And that's the fun right there. Mm. I have a, a little fun fact of my own, actually. 95% of people who use the phrase fun fact are misusing the word fun. <laughs> or the word fact, or both. <laughs> Obviously, I made up the 95%, but it doesn't really matter because it's only a fun fact. It doesn't have to be that true, does it? There is a huge industry in fun facts now. People share them all over the place. Nobody ever seems to check. It doesn't really matter if they're true or not. There's loads of people sharing them on Twitter. Here's one of the accounts. You get things like this. WTF facts. I presume that stands for what's the fact? Facts. Uh, <laughs> and they have 867,000 followers on Twitter. OMG facts is even bigger. They've got over 6 million followers on Twitter. And the daddy of them all is, I believe, Uber facts who have 6.11 million followers on Twitter. You get fun facts like this from OMG facts. Kiribati, that's how you pronounce it, is the only country that falls in all four hemispheres. And that is true. It's a little collection of tiny islands. If you slice the world that way, it's in both the northern and the southern hemispheres. And if you slice the world that way, it's in the eastern and the western hemispheres. And when I read that, I checked it up. It is true. Well, oh, that's yeah, fun. Get it. Or you get this from Uber facts. Uh, you need to be shorter than six foot three in order to get a job as an astronaut. Again, I didn't know that. I looked it up. It's true. Oh, yeah. And then there's this from WTF facts. Gandhi once wrote a letter to his dear friend urging him not to go to war. This friend was Hitler. <laughs> that is a true fact. I've checked it out. If you look it up, you very quickly discover that a movie has been made about that very subject. It's an Indian movie. It is called Gandhi to Hitler. Now, come on. Any fact that has led to an Indian man being legitimately cast as Adolf Hitler <laughs> is an entertaining fact. Don't pretend it isn't. Don't pretend there's anything dodgy about enjoying the weirdness of that. That is an amazing image, isn't it? It makes it look like one man's journey from Gandhi to Hitler. <laughs> but that is, I think, legitimately a fun fact. But I'm not convinced that everything they tweet meets the strict criteria of fact. You get things like this. Polar bears can eat as many as 86 penguins in one city. <laughs> According to who? Under what circumstances? In a very cruel zoo, I would say. <laughs> I've looked into it. London Zoo has only got about 60 penguins. As far as I can work out, this involves two very cruel zookeepers and a van. <laughs> How can 
this have ever happened? Who has calculated this? It can't possibly be true. Unless, unless they mean those. <laughs> In which case, so can I. No big deal. By the way, uh, when I told you earlier about the, the polar bears and, and the penguins not meeting because they live in different things, uh, this is how I remember which one's in the Antarctic and which one's in the Arctic. Because you've got the, the penguin bar there from McVitie's, and then you've also got the Arctic bar from Towergate, exclusive to Lidl, the Arctic bar with the polar bear. That's how I remember the two. It really annoys me when people try and suggest that they are in any way <laughs> ripping off McVitie's with these things. They really are completely different products. They in fact, they are literally poles apart. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Here's another uber fact for you. <laughs> Having sex in a tent can actually... Oh, can actually what? I'll tell you what having sex in a tent can actually do after this short break. <laughs> Welcome back to Modern Life is Goodish, ladies and gentlemen, where we have been discussing the world of fun facts. In particular, I was about to show you what, according to Uberfacts, having sex in a tent can actually do. Uberfacts says that having sex in a tent can actually improve your sex life. <laughs> well, yes, it can, to the tune of one sex. <laughs> What is your sex life other than a record of how much sex you have? It doesn't mean anything, does it? Of course having sex in a tent can improve your sex life. Having sex anywhere can improve it. In a way, I think it does depend on the tent as well, doesn't it? I mean, yes, lovely. You can see how that would work, absolutely. No. <laughs> no. You introduce six clowns and a paying crowd and that is not improving anything for me, ladies and gentlemen. Very nice, lovely, absolutely. Not so keen. <laughs> I'm not sure that's possible. <laughs> and my favourite thing about this sex in a tent fun fact is the word actually. The actually improve your sex life. Actually is a word often used by fun fact purveyors. Actually makes something sound like a fun fact when it isn't. You can add the word actually to any old dull fact and it will sound, just in the tone of voice, a bit more fun. Do you know the most popular soft drink in the 1970s was actually a liquid? <laughs> you see? That's all it does, isn't it? If you just said having sex in a tent can improve your sex life, all of a sudden that doesn't sound like a fun fact anymore, does it? They use actual and actually all the time to add this sort of note of surprise to the voice in your head. You get things like this. The Shrek movies were based on an actual... Now, I don't know about you, <laughs> but there's only one word that follows actual that makes the actual earn its keep in that sentence, and that is Shrek. <laughs> if you said the Shrek movies were based on an actual Shrek, I would be amazed. But that can't be the answer, because it's not true. The real word that follows actual is children's book. <laughs> well, that's not surprising at all, is it? Oh, really? A children's film was based on an actual children's book. As far as I can tell, the words actual and Shrek go hand in hand far more often than they really should. For example, you get things like this on BuzzFeed. There, I'm not sure who that penguin is running away from up there, but I really, I really wish that had been the picture there. That would have, <laughs> that would have been perfect, wouldn't it? It wasn't there, never mind. But as you can see, this couple had an actual Shrek-themed wedding. But surely the word actual is not necessary here, is it? What they mean is, this couple had a Shrek-themed wedding. Because there is no version of a Shrek-themed wedding other than an actual one. No one's ever said, oh, I hear you had a, a Shrek-themed wedding. Did you dress up? No. No. <laughs> well, what, what did you do then? We just thought about Shrek a lot, yeah. Yeah, we didn't tell anyone it was just a Shrek-themed wedding in here. It was just for me and him, you know. We didn't tell anyone else. I mean, I'll give them this. They went for it. I'll give them that. They did. They went for it. Good for them. If you want to know where these things come from, you have to do your own research. And I think I have tracked down where the sex in a tent fact came from. I googled a few of the phrases and I found this article in Men's Health magazine. Have sex in a tent. Five tips for roughing it in the buff. Written by a man with the perfect name for this article. Justin Park. <laughs> 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 I 
It was illustrated with this picture, which actually appears to be a woman having sex with a tent. Um, <laughs> but let's remove that smutty image from our minds and concentrate on the text, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you can see, they are quoting a book called Sex in a Tent, A Wild Couple's Guide to Getting Naughty in Nature, which was written by an author called Michelle Weitzman. So I looked that book up. Here it is. And this is the book's Amazon page, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely little detail here. Uh, people who viewed sex in a tent also viewed sleeping bag liners. <laughs> 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 well, of course they bloody did. What else would you expect? But if you click on the look inside link, you will quickly find the introduction basically says how camping can improve your sex life. Now, I can't prove that I'm right, but if I had to bet money on it, I would say that the fact that this book about having sex in a tent tells you that it will improve your sex life is the reason Uberfacts is telling the world with confidence that it is a fact. But the fun facts keep on coming. You can't stop that train from rolling. You get things like this on a website called Celebrity Tube. 15 interesting facts about Sir Richard Branson. I actually clicked a link that described it as 15 cool facts. When I got there, the headline says 15 interesting facts. And you can see down here, it actually does say 15 fun facts. They have set themselves a hard task here. These facts have got to be both cool, interesting, and fun all at the same time. I'm going to give you my highlights of their 15 facts about Richard Branson. Uh, number two, Branson is a high school dropout. You read that correctly. No, I didn't. No. <laughs> I think you'll find I said dropout. Anyway, <laughs> oftentimes we read about college dropouts, but Branson dropped out of high school at the age of 16. What? You mean at school leavers' age? <laughs> the age at which one is legally allowed to leave school in the UK, where he's from? Surely that's not dropping out, is it? OK, he didn't technically drop out, as the school system is a little different abroad. But come on, 16. We're only on fact number two, and they're already admitting it's not a fact. If someone says to you, here are 15 facts, and by the time you get to number two, it's already 50% non-fact, you've got to worry, haven't you? But this, this is just the hors d'oeuvre. My favourite of these 15 facts is this one. Number 14, ladies and gentlemen, he's a family man. And they've got some information to back up this daring assertion. And I'll tell you what, the sentence that follows this, their evidence for Richard Branson's family man nature is genuinely, without a word of a lie, my favourite sentence that has ever been written in the English language. I want to have time to dissect it properly with you, which is why I'm going to wait until we come back from this short break. <laughs> Welcome back to Modern Life is Goodish, ladies and gentlemen, where we have been talking about fun facts in general, and in particular, about Richard Branson and the Celebrity Tube website, who claim to have 15 fun, interesting, and indeed cool facts about him. Number 14 is my favourite of them. He's a family man. OK, that's the fact. Here comes the evidence. And it is my favourite sentence that has ever been written in the English language. You've got to try to keep hold of every clause as this sentence builds, OK? He's a family man. Here we go. Despite his success in business, OK? Hold on to that. Despite his success in business. Imagine that you are writing a sentence yourself that begins, despite his success in business, and is going to prove to the reader that the subject is a family man. What are you concocting notionally in your own mind? For me, it's going to be, despite his success in business, he insists on spending every Sunday afternoon having lunch with his wife and children. That's the kind of sentence that I am imagining this building into, but it's not the sentence we're going into. Here it goes. Despite his success in business, According to a British poll, <laughs> remember the poll we all took about Richard Branson, despite his success in business? <laughs> According to a British poll, he is one of those few men, yeah, one of the few men, not the only one, there are a few men who are also in this poll, and despite his success in business, he is one of those few men. After Mother Teresa... <laughs> Business, according to a British poll, he is one of those 
those few men after Mother Teresa, who was a woman, everyone knows that. I know she wasn't a hottie, but come on, there's a clue. There's a clue in the name, isn't there? There's a clue in the name, Mother Teresa. Despite his success in business, according to a British poll, he is one of those few men after Mother Teresa, hold on to it all, who could be eligible, not who is definitely eligible. The British public weren't sure he could be eligible. If Mother Teresa wasn't available <laughs> and you were forced to go to some men, the British public decided that Richard Branson, potentially, we weren't sure, but he could be eligible to write the Ten Commandments. What is that? Who published that? In what world? Could somebody write that, send it to someone else and have them say, yeah, I'll put that on the website. That makes sense. What are they doing? The Ten not to rewrite the Ten Commandments, not to write Ten New Commandments, to write the Ten Commandments. That's the existing Ten Commandments. This is a world in which someone's saying, imagine we've all forgotten the Ten Commandments. We know Mother Teresa remembers them, but she's busy. <laughs> Who else do we think might, might know them? I know Richard Branson. <laughs> if we are to take this at face value, they are expecting us to believe that at some point in time, the British public have been asked the question, who are the few men, after Mother Teresa, who could be eligible to write the Ten Commandments? And that we, in reply, said Richard Branson is one of those men. Nobody has ever asked the British public that question, have they? They can't have done. Not until now. <laughs> because I have. <laughs> By proxy, that there, ladies and gentlemen, holding the microphone, is a friend of mine called Annabel Port. And the man there in the blue suit is a complete stranger. I sent Annabel out with a camera and a microphone. Because if you've got a camera and a microphone, people will stop and let you ask them anything. <laughs> so I told her to go out and ask a lot of people this question. Who would you say are the few men after Mother Teresa who could be eligible to write the Ten Commandments? She could not explain, she could not try to add context, she could do nothing to make the question make sense. All she could do was ask that question. And she asked in one afternoon between 60 and 70 people. Who would you say are the few men, are the few men, are the few men after Mother Teresa, after Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, Teresa, who could be eligible to write the Ten Commandments, to write the Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments, Ten Commandments. <laughs> and obviously, having asked that many people that question, we have an awful lot of footage of people doing this. Oh my God. <laughs> There's a woman in that clip, I think she was your favourite as well, the first woman in that clip. She had exactly the right reaction to that question. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, that is the right answer. That's a face that says this makes no sense whatsoever. Surely the weirdest people are the ones who had an answer. Seriously, watch this. Who would you say are the few men after Mother Teresa who could be eligible to write the Ten Commandments? Stephen Fry? <laughs> Stephen Fry? <laughs> I mean, Stephen Fry is the answer to a lot of questions. But what question does she think she's being asked? I like Stephen Fry. I think he's wonderful, but I don't understand the world in which he is one of the few men after Mother Teresa who could be eligible to write the Ten Commandments. That is the wrong answer, isn't it? Of all the people we asked, this is my favourite guy. This is Dundee saved my life, man. His, his reaction is just wonderful. Okay, so we're looking at someone who's really influential, somebody that's going to do really well. Um, I'm going to have to guess. Guess? <laughs> it's not a quiz. You're not being asked a question, you're being asked for your opinion. 
Do you prefer apples or oranges? Oh, I don't know. I'm going to have to guess. <laughs> Just watch the amount of thought Dundee Save My Life Man puts in to this. But I'm going to say... Um, God, let me think. I want it to be good. Yeah, you want, it, you want it to be good, don't you? Yeah? You don't want to come out with a silly answer to a question like that and make a fool of yourself, do you? Here he goes. I'm going to go with the Pope. The Pope! <laughs> you can't! You cannot! You cannot think for that long about somebody who might know the Ten Commandments and then only come up with the Pope. <laughs> I think, you know what, I am wasting my talents trying to win 30 quid in drinks vouchers in a pub quiz, aren't I? You can win big money for knowing stuff these days, and I know some stuff. I, I saw a programme recently, an amazing programme, daytime TV on ITV, Dickinson's Real Deal. Oh, I watched it one Sunday, I was immediately hooked. I ended up watching it for a whole week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. I'll show you why. They have questions like this for big money, £2,600. Which country is particularly associated with bullfighting? Is it A, Spain? Or is it B, Germany? Or is it C, Poland? Yeah. Which one could it be? You can win £2,600 for knowing that. If you've never seen the programme, David Dickinson is there to try and help people to get a good deal for their antiques. But it's the competition that interests me. And this, according to the ITV website, is how the competition works. As you can see, it's the same every day of the week. It says, how much will today's special item make at auction? Answer the question featured in the show correctly, and you could win a cash prize equivalent to the final selling price. This was Sunday's competition item, ladies and gentlemen. And that one up there, and they haven't put those like that by accident, have they? Um, it's like he's in a weird, fully clothed remake of Calendar Girls. Now, they were Sunday's competition item, and here goes David with a recap of how the competition feature works. They're about to be sold any moment now under the auctioneer's gavel, and whatever they bring, well, same as always, that's the amount we'll be giving away in cash to today's lucky competition winner. There you go, you all heard him say it, same as always. That's how the competition works, or is it? Well, I suppose the proof of the pudding is in the, in, in the baking. That's not right, is it? Stewing. What is it? Eating. Sorry, yeah, the, 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 I guess the proof of the pudding is in the eating. That's it. So these were sold at auction. The gavel has eventually gone down at £2,600. And that's the amount that we're going to give away to today's lucky competition winner. There you go, £2,600. That is a good prize for daytime telly, if you ask me. I'll have a go at that. I had a go. I didn't win, but that made me think, right, I am watching tomorrow. There's going to be more money on offer. Now, on the Monday, it was this item, and it went for, ladies and gentlemen... The gavel has just gone down at £65. £65? It was £2,600 yesterday. Who gives away £2,600 one day and £65 the next? Not David Dickinson, that's who. He is a renegade. He is a rule breaker. But that's nowhere near good enough for a competition prize. And so I'm going to place £4,000 in front of that. And today's competition prize will read £4,065. And we all heard him yesterday. We all heard him say it. Same as always. That's the amount we'll be giving away in cash. You little liar. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad he's a liar, because 4065 is an amount worth winning, but even so... Of course, once you've seen the Sunday and then the Monday, how can you not tune in to see what happens next on this carousel of lunacy? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you this. On Tuesday, the competition item was this sword. It sold for £480, ladies and gentlemen. Watch what he does after that. I'm going to place £4,000 in front of that. The prize now reads £4,480. It sold for 480 and he just added another £4,000, and yet... Same as always, that's the amount we'll be giving away in cash. No, that's not true, is it? There are two rules. If it's a decent amount at auction, you give that away, and if it isn't, you add four grand. How could you not want to know what's going to happen on the Wednesday? Oh, when the competition item was a diamond ring, 18 karat gold. It sold, ladies and gentlemen, for £400. I think the pattern has been established. What do you think he's going to do? Add 4,000. OK, let's have a look. Well, that's not good enough for one of our competition prizes. And so I'm going to place... Are you still confident? <laughs> there you are. 
Alan? Yeah, let's see what he does. And so I'm going to place £5,000 in front of that. And I'm going to say today's competition prize is £5,400. There are no rules anymore. <laughs> the man is making this shit up as he goes along. And yet, well, same as always. No, it's not. The only thing that's the same is that every day is bloody different. <laughs> Now, on Thursday, they had two cast metal figures. They sold for £920. What do you think he did with £920? Any guesses? £3,000 in front. OK, well, let's see what he does. He does this. Not good enough for a competition prize. I'm going to award today £6,000. Yes! Not £6,920. He hasn't got 6,000 in front of it, and you've just revealed yourself to be a person who watches way too much daytime telly. <laughs> Don't be proud of that. You've just shamed yourself on national television by knowing that kind of shit. And we all heard him. Same as always. <laughs> Finally, to round out the week, ladies and gentlemen, it was this, a gold watch chain, which went for £800. And what do you think the prize money was? I'm going to award £10,000. Ten grand! The man's making it up! This is what happened across the week. On Sunday, they raised 2,600 at auction, and you get a prize of 2,600, exactly as advertised. Well, same as always. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Monday and Tuesday. Monday is so bad, you can't even see it on the graph properly. 65 quid. He just makes up a number, 4,000, and shoves it in front of them both. On the Wednesday, it's 400 pounds, lower than the Tuesday, more than the Monday, but this time, he adds 5,000 to it. By Thursday, he is completely ignoring the blue bar. That is no longer relevant. He's thrown it away. He's just throwing six grand at the problem. And on the Friday, he ignores the blue bar again and throws 10 grand at it. The man is a lunatic. If you ignore the blue bars, which is, after all, what David Dickinson is doing, you can see there is a very dangerous rising trend here, isn't there? If he keeps going, it'll be a disaster. If you scale that back and then extrapolate forwards, by the end of week two, he's going to be giving away 32 grand. If he goes for three weeks, he's going to be giving away 150 grand. If he keeps going for a month, he's going to be giving away a million pounds. This man must be stopped, ladies and gentlemen. He's going to bankrupt ITV. And bear in mind, you can win these kind of sums of money for knowing stuff like this. According to the popular expression, the proof of the pudding is in the what? Is it A, eating, B, baking, or C, stewing? Now, you might think, at least as an idiot tax, at least some people are going to get the answers wrong. This is going to weed out those people. But I looked up the terms and conditions on the ITV website. You can enter up to three times per phone number. For the three answers, you can have one go at each. You don't need to know anything at all. Everyone's welcome at this quiz. You can enter in lots of different ways. You can also enter by text message. But again, three entries per phone number. And do you know what? They don't shout about it. They ha do mention it. They have to legally. You can also enter for free on the ITV website for free on the website and you can also enter up to three times obviously that is the way I choose to enter these competitions why would anyone choose to spend one pound 54 entering a thing they can enter for free so why don't we all get together and just all enter for free only one of us has to watch it <laughs> If one person shares the answer on Twitter every day, and I think we all know who that's going to be, <laughs> and we all enter for free and we all split the winnings, that's got to be worth a go, hasn't it? And incidentally, don't think I'm tarring ITV with this brush. They're not the only ones who do this kind of competition. The channel I am working for right now have done them as well. And they asked me if I would have one in this show. And I said I will, but only if the question is, What's the most sensible way of entering a competition? Is it A, by phone, costing £1.54, B, by text, costing £1.50 plus network rate, is it C, online, for free? <laughs> or is it D, Stephen Fry? <laughs> <laughs> or E, I'm going to go with the Pope. <laughs> Which is why, same as always, I won't be asking this question later in the show. But I will see you after the break. <laughs> Welcome back 
to Modern Life is Goodish, where we have been talking, have we not, about fun facts. And you might be wondering, where do fun facts come from? And I'll tell you, some facts are manufactured by companies who you might think have some kind of vested interest. And because they have a vested interest, I think it's right to question the veracity of the facts that they pump out into our world. Here's an example of the kind of facts I'm talking about. This was in The Express. Three quarters of couples say Spark has gone. It was even in The Times. Three out of four couples admit that the passion has gone from their relationship. For a week, this fact was all over the place. It became a big fun talking point for radio phone-ins and all that. But where did this fact come from? If we have a closer look at the Express article, it should become clear. Let's examine the text in the opening part of the article where it says, three out of four couples reckon the fizz has gone flat in their relationship. One in ten said the spark started to fade within the first year together. The poll of 2,000 couples found for the average relationship the bubble bursts after three and a half years. Now let's have a look at a later section of the same article where you can see it says, Fiona Hope, MD of SodaStream UK, who commissioned the research. When did SodaStream become scientists in love and relationships? Why are our newspapers reporting what SodaStream's research says about relationships as if it's meaningful and important? If you put those two bits of text side by side, it becomes quite clear that SodaStream have paid for this so that the words fizz, spark, bubble and sparkle can appear on the same page of newsprint as the word SodaStream. <laughs> this is ridiculous, isn't it? I'm not saying they haven't asked 2,000 people, I'm just saying that maybe they haven't done it with the scientific rigour that you would want for real research. And this isn't a one-off. Loads of these get printed. You've always got to look at paragraph 6 and 7 in these articles to see where it's come from. Here's the Express again. Winston Churchill is voted the greatest of gents. It became a fact that Winston Churchill was the greatest British gentleman of the 20th century. According to this article and according to this in the Star, Winston Churchill is the winner. The Mail Online provided a handy list of all the runners and riders. The Grant brothers were doing well, obviously, as you'd expect. <laughs> Some people make more sense than others, you know, Trevor McDonald's at number 11, Richard Branson's at 15. <laughs> Presumably numbers 1 through 14 are the other few men after Mother Teresa who <laughs> could be eligible to write the Ten Commandments. But I think you've got to question the veracity of a poll where three consecutive numbers, 39, 40 and 41, all come from the world of Formula One. It does rather suggest that they were asking a very particular demographic, doesn't it? Where were they asking the questions? Where were they stopping people? Were they stood outside Silverstone on the day of a Grand Prix? Who have they asked? Under what circumstances? Who did the asking? I love the language of these things. This is the mail still, where they point out David Beckham only made it in ninth place. As if it's somehow a disappointment for David Beckham to only come ninth place in a competition that he didn't enter and didn't know was happening. <laughs> continue with that language. There's Winston Churchill in first place. Stephen Fry got a bronze. <laughs> got a bronze! I'm not surprised that he was at the front of some people's brains. You can ask some people absolutely anything. And... Stephen Fry? There you go. <laughs> but then you get this. Further down the article, a spokesman for Austin Reed, which carried out the poll, that's a gentleman's outfit as Austin Reed, said Sir Winston Churchill showed unprecedented courage and strength to lead this country and is a worthy choice as the greatest British gentleman. And then, in the very next sentence, in fact, Austin Reed made Winston Churchill's famous siren suits during the war. Do you think it is beyond the realms of possibility that Austin Reed, knowing they had made suits that Winston Churchill wore during the war, were able to concoct a survey that would guarantee that Winston Churchill came out on top? People got very upset about this. They get very agitated about this kind of poll. They don't agree with the results. And I like it when people get worked up about stuff like this. I start to salivate. I start to search around in the different news sites, reading the comments, scooping up the dregs from the bottom of the internet. I took the comments I found there and I turned them into something more beautiful. Something that I like to call a found poem, which I would like to perform for you now. No surprise that Churchill is top of the pops. Considering his great gift of rewriting history to suit himself and frequently boasting that it was his right to rat and re-rat and to lie, 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 lie and lie again. 
Winston Churchill was a dirty liar. Winston Churchill's pants are on fire. <laughs> you, sir, disgust me. Churchill was the greatest. The greatest living Englishman when he was alive and for long after that. <laughs> Winston Churchill? It's always Winston bloody Churchill. <laughs> Bored now. I know he led our nation through a time of war, but let's not forget that when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, he took money from motor tax and did not spend it on roads. <laughs> so you can say what you like about him in my book, because he was no friend of the motorist. Where was Clarkson? <laughs> Clarkson, Hammond, Stig, May. That's my top four. Lol. <laughs> Churchill was the greatest. He was the greatest of this century, the last century, and of any century. Whatever century you care to name, the facts remain the same. If Churchill had lived then, he would have been the greatest. I know it's a big if, but I'm right. He was the greatest. I've no doubt my comment will be deleted, but I'm going to say it anyway. Trevor MacDonald isn't British. He is from Trinidad. I'm not being racist. It's a fact. That said, he's more of a gentleman than David, ooh, bend it like me Beckham. So I'm glad to see Sir Trev on the list. Why is Helen Mirren not on this list? <laughs> I know she is a woman, but she is more of a gentleman than most of this sorry, soggy lot. And for that matter, where is the Queen? <laughs> I thank you. The Bill Ross Spring Quartet, ladies and gentlemen. And I tell you what, keep applauding if you think that modern life is good, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, there you go. In a survey of more than 200 people, 100% said that they thought that modern life is goodish. That is a fact. A fun fact. It's not true. It's a fun fact. Thanks for watching. Good night.